Right, let's get started. First of all, very good morning, and thank you guys for making it. Um, as you guys know, Professor Diksha is in Abu Dhabi, and uh, we volunteered to give this lecture because A, we really like these topics, and B, we wanted to be thorough with these topics as well. So hopefully we can make it worth your guys' mornings. Right? Sorry, can you increase the volume, please? I can't really hear you. All right, can you hear me now? That's much better, thank you. All right, I'll just hold it. Cool, so the topic for today is transformers and GNNs. We did cover some part of transformers in the last lecture, so we'll be borrowing or moving off of that as a platform. Uh, UA will be covering GNNs right after I'm done, about the midway point. And yeah, with that, let's get into the first part, which is transformers. Uh, before I begin, I must give credit where it's due. I have learned about transformers from a variety of sources. Some of them are listed here. Uh, one of them is the multimodal class by L.P. Morenci, the advanced NLP class by Graham Newbig, the introduction to deep learning class by Professor Riksha, a bunch of YouTube videos, medium articles, and whatnot. So I encourage you guys to use all of these resources. They're awesome. And yeah, with that, let's get started. So uh, as you recall, in the last lecture, we talked about how, I mean, we talked about sequence to sequence models, we talked about encoders and decoders, and we talked about how we can make use of every single encoder output to get every single decoder output. We didn't want to deal with the problem of the last final hidden state of the encoder not being able to capture all the information. So we use this query key value and attention sort of paradigm to make use of every single encoder output. What we also talked about is self-attention, which is a very, very important building block for transformers. And we talked about something known as the energy function, which is a fancy name for a score function. We try to calculate how important we think each token is or each representation is to each representation. And we also talked about something known as the attention function, which is mostly just a softmax of this energy function or of this scoring function, right? Lastly, we talked about how RNNs are great, but they're also slow and sequential, right? RNNs have this autoregressive property and they must be computed in a certain order. Bidirectional allows you to be computed in left to right and right to left, but the computation still needs to follow that order and it can't really be parallelized beyond the, the regular matrix multiplication, right? So this is where transformers really, really help. They can be parallelized, and the amount of computation required to get the same amount of performance is way lower than LSTMs and RNNs. Right. Cool, so with that in mind, why transformers? Right. What we want are, in any sequence, we want representations which change with their surroundings. That is, we want dynamic representations. Right. For example, you have a sentence, I like this movie, versus I do not like this movie. The representation for the word like has to be different in these two cases. One of them is a very positive sentiment. The other one is a very negative sentiment. So whatever model we use should be able to understand that these two are two very differing emotions that we're trying to portray, portray here. Well, we talked about vanilla RNNs being pretty slow and regular RNNs also have pretty terrible memory, right? We talked about how they don't really keep account of the inputs at all. And so we used LSTMs or GRUs to fix this memory problem, right? But they are still slow and sequential. CNNs, on the other hand, they can be parallelized, right? But they have the problem of their kernels on, and their weight matrices being static. So we lose the dynamic point, right? Nothing changes with context. So in a nutshell, what we want is parallelizability, we want good memory, and we also want the dynamic property. Cool. So this is a topic which me personally, I found really confusing. Why do we call them query keys and values? Does anybody want to take a guess? Yeah. I have a question about the previous slide, if that's okay. Yeah. So uh, when you say same can be parallelized, do you mean in one particular hidden layer? Is that correct? Correct. So when you're, uh, when you're sweeping the kernel across the input image, you still need to do the sequential processing. But CNNs, since they do parameter sharing, they are a lot more efficient than, in vanilla terms, they're a lot more efficient than regular MLPs or regular RNNs, right? But for layer, still need exactly. to Exactly, yeah, yeah. 
We only mention CNNs here because they are a viable candidate. And still, transformers have all the properties that we need, but CNNs don't. OK, any takers for why do we call them query keys and values? Um, so from my perspective, I only care and ask the key is how much from the perspective of people that you want to rebuild the founder. And then the query is what well, you can Perspective of how much you want to just focus on what you're asking them to. Mm -hmm. And that one is just what you want ultimately, so you call them the real values. Yeah. Does any, is anybody familiar with SQL here? Any kind of database? So, all right, for those of you who are, queries is what you type in to get some data, right? Keys, technique, usually in a database, point to where the information is. And values in that sense are the information itself. So in my opinion, personally, I think that's where this is borrowed from. But in very simple terms, query is what pays the attention. This is what's looking for where do I get my information from. Values are what are paid attention to. Right? This is where the information is extracted from. The keys are there, which are usually the same as values, are there to help the query the asker to understand how much information I should get from each of the values. Right. And of course, this is where the attention weights come in. So queries and keys allow you to calculate attention weights. And with the combination of attention weights and values, you get your contextualized weighted sum sort of a representation. Right. So let's take this example, which is, this is a great example. And there's this guy, which is representing the word this, the first token there. And he's wondering, how do I adapt to my context? I mean, this is the whole problem, right? We want contextualization. So how do I adapt to my context? There are also all these other blue guys out there to help. And they're like, hey, look, this is me. This is my information. See if you can use it to figure out how you can get your contextualized representation. And the guy's goal, of course, is to get to O sub this, which is its contextualized representation. And it thinks, maybe I can do a weighted sum. Maybe I can use all of this information and get a weighted sum to get to my final output representations. And it thinks, obviously, to do a weighted sum, I need a set of weights. So let's assume we have some set of weights. We'll represent them by alpha. We'll call them attention weights for now. And it thinks, all right, now I can use this to get to my output. So, all right, let's assume I have some black box calculator, which will do this magical computation for me. I'll put in my information. I'll put in all the information from all these other guys who are ready to help me. And I'll get to my weights, and I'll get to my output. Yeah. So all right, let's come together. Let's put everything in, in one box. And let's try to calculate how important each of your tokens are to me, me being the red guy. So we use the term energy function here to calculate scores. We score each of the inputs and see, all right, this is how important you are, this is how important you are, et cetera, et cetera. We pass everything through a softmax, so we can convert everything to a 0, 1, uh, sort of a range and everything sums up to one so that we don't give additional weight, no more extra information coming in. And now we have the weights and now we can use them to get to our output. Yeah. So what we do is we have these weights. We also have these values from all of these people that gave us the keys in the first place. We multiply them element by element. We take a sum and we have it. We have our contextualized representation, right? The guy's happy. So in this whole situation, of course, the red guy was the query. He was the guy trying to find out how do I contextualize my own representation. All these people who were ready to help were the keys. Like, all right, this is my information. Try to use them to contextualize yourself. Again, there's the queries. There are the keys. We have the attention weights, which come down here. What we use with the attention weights is what we call the values. Once you multiply them, the weighted sum gives us the contextualized representation. Right? Any questions so far? Yeah. So uh, the blue box is not represented as the uh, text itself, but it is actually like a back here. Where we can yeah, yeah. This yeah. is the key value. And yeah. Key key, right? So here it's the values, because we use the values with the weights to get to the output. One thing that you need to keep in mind is the first thing we talked about, which is it's a lot of transitions, is this, right? Query is looking for information. Keys let you use the information, and values are the information, right? 
So here, again, there's a lot of transitions. Uh, right, here, what you use is the values finally to get to the output, right? And this gives you the, the attention rates. Anything else? Awesome. So let's get to some more diagrammatic representations. So we have these input representations, H1 through H5, for this is a great example. The first thing we do is we project everything into the dimensionality of the model that we want. This is nothing but one linear computation. The, way, the WQ, WK, WV here are nothing but weight matrices, which you multiply with the input representation, and then we go in. For, for what it's worth, the input representations can be anything. They can be, in terms of NLP, they can be word to vec, they can be glove, uh, they can also be one hard representations of where these things are in your whole vocabulary, anything, right? We do this for every single token. We use the same weight matrices, by the way, for every single token, right? We take one, we take one query, one key, and calculate one energy score or one attention score, right? We do this five more times, four more times, and get the scores for each of the tokens. We pass everything through a softmax, and we have our attention rates, right? Here, alpha m comma n basically says how important is token n to token m's contextual meaning, right? So we're gonna use this little shorthand here. And now we take all of the values that we found for all of the inputs, multiply them with each of the attention weights that we found. Again, take a weighted sum. And again, we get to the output. It's the same story as before, it's just in a more diagrammatic, quote unquote, smarter way. And what we use in transformers, or in the at least in the original paper, is what's called as a scaled dot product attention. So let's let's break this down a little bit. The word scaled here comes from this term, which is divided by the dimensionality of the keys. And any takers for why we do this? This is done before we pass it into softmax. Okay. In a nutshell, it's for numerical stability of computation. We don't want anything to be too exaggerated, too not exaggerated. We just want things to be nice and well balanced, right? The dot product is our energy function here, or it's the function we use to score each of the keys using our query. And well, attention is the attention that we have, right? So this alpha i comma dot basically represents the whole vector, which is alpha one one through alpha one five, right? And we get well, our output with a dot product of alpha i with v and all the values, right? And once again, as a gigantic poster, this is all parallelizable, which is the whole point of transformers, right? Cool, let's take a small example, right? We're gonna make some few simplicity assumptions here, but let's say we have three tokens or three time steps in our sequence. Each of them have the same query key and value, again, for simplicity. And they are one, two, three, four, four, five, nine, one, six, two, one, four. These are numbers I thought were okay at 10 p.m. in the night. And um, yeah, we get scores for each of them, right? We get, so we use the same query key transpose, which is the drop product of queries and keys. Apologies, this is not really alpha yet. This is supposed to be alpha prime. Uh, we'll fix this when we upload uh, the slides. And we divide it by the square root of three, which is the dimensionality of the keys, which should also be four, by the way, I just realized. Never make examples too late in the night. But let's run with this for now, right? We get alpha one, which is the, which is the weighted sum. So we get, we pass all this whole vector, E1, E2, E3, through a softmax, and we get these outputs. And we take a dot product of alpha and V, and we get a output representation of our input. So this O1, ignoring some of the issues here in this example, but this O1 will represent the contextual representation of our first token, right? So we're gonna take one more shorthand, and all of this computation will represent us calculating one full set of attention weights, right? And we have this implied softmax before we get to alpha one. 
Cool, we take all of the values, which is precisely what we did. With one set of attention weights, we use all sets of values. And you can see that the shape of alpha should be five comma nothing. Uh, the shape of the values would be uh, five comma dv, which is the dimensionality of our values. And of course, these can be multiplied, and we get an output of shape dv comma nothing, right? And it's nothing but a weighted sum of everything in a sequence. And we do this for every single time step, and we have all of our outputs, right? One thing to note here is, for the purposes of explainability, we did, we did them one by one. But of course, this whole thing can be done in parallel, right? So this is your self-attention module, almost. But this is the major heavy lifting part, right? And again, this is parallelizable in a big poster sort of format. A can be calculated as a softmax of QK transpose divided by square root of DK, and your outputs can be calculated by the dot product of these attention weights and your values. These capital letters in bold are supposed to signify full matrices, so we're not using a single row anymore, right? So we have this self-attention module. It takes in some inputs, it gives you some outputs, and what we call here this thing is the single-headed attention because there's only one sort of model or one sort of set of weights trying to find how much information do I pay to all of my peers. But what if we, all right, before that, you have a poll. It's available at 1442. <coughs> Let's give you about 20 seconds before we get back on. Cool, any takers for the answers? Yeah. So to calculate the attention weights for input H sub I, you would use the query Q sub I and all of the keys, and the energy function is scaled to allow for numerical stability. It is not scaled to allow for the range of zero to one, that's what softmax does, and of course the first one is false because the second one is true. Cool, so we have all of these input representations, H1 through H5. What if we split all of them into K sub inputs, right? So let's assume all of these are 10 dimensional. We might split them up into five sub segments. The first two dimensions of each of the inputs go into the first green part and the last two go in the last blue part, yeah? And once we split them, we pass them through their own attention module, right? So we'll get their own sets of outputs, and we can concatenate all of them the same way we split the input to get our final output representations. What this would accomplish is what's known as the multi-headed attention. And the reason we do this is because there's not just one kind of relation that we're looking for between two tokens, right? In terms of language, again, there could be subject-verb agreement, there could be subject-object, uh, relations. There could be dependencies that one object has and another object happening in a sentence. And we might need a way for us to figure out how all of these different dependencies work. Right? But this uses a couple of very bold assumptions. Any guesses of what some of these assumptions are? The assumptions on which they think this last point here would actually work. Well, if you think about it, if you split, and let's take a realistic example here. Let's say we have 300 dimensional inputs, which is usually what you can get from things like word to vec or glove and things of that nature. Let's assume 300 is a good number. And we split things into six parts, so 50 dimensions each, right? To calculate, and since we do it in six parts, we are hoping to at least find six different kinds of relations between all of our five inputs. But this uses the assumption that the information required for those six kinds of relations 
is self-contained within the 50 that we sort of split these things in. It's entirely possible that the first 50 and the last 50 talk about the same thing, right? Who's to know that? And in that case, you will have some amount of redundancy in what we calculate, right? It's also possible that section one and section two sort of have the same information, but they are mutually exclusive. It's possible that they're both sort of talking about uh, a dependency parse of a sentence, and you need both of them to have a full information. In that case, you will not have the complete information in the output at all. But with these assumptions, it still tends to work quite well, right? So thing is, we don't 100% understand where this information is present in the input representations, but doing a multi-headed self-attention tends to sort of figure these things out, right? So we come to the paper which introduced this, which is attention is all you need. Uh, I should clear this up for a, for a very long time. I thought this paper introduced attention. It didn't. It was a paper in 2015 by Barnado. Uh, and that guy used attention on RNN uh, structures. But this paper, what transformers did is they completely got rid of all recurrence. They said, all we need rightly the title, is attention. All we need are attention blocks to do all of this computation that we want to do, right? So, so far we've talked about, so there are three major diagrams in the paper and I highly encourage you guys to read it. They have not explained everything. They're from Google, they think everybody understands everything anyway. But um, the paper is still quite nice. And um, there are three major diagrams as I said. These two, which we've already kind of talked about. Admittedly, we haven't talked about the mask parentheses opt, which is optional yet, but we'll get to it soon enough. So let's get to this big gigantic monster here, right? This is the whole transformer block. The NX on each side just says these blocks are repeated N number of times on the encoder side and on the decoder side, right? The thing on the left, the left of you is the encoder and on your right is the decoder, right? So let's try to break this whole thing down. The first thing you should notice is on the encoder side, the multi-headed attention is what we call the encoder self-attention. And this is precisely what we've seen so far. It's the same vanilla multi-headed self-attention blocks stacked on top of each other, right? On the decoder side, we have what's called as the masked multi-headed attention. This is where the optional mask comes in. So question, do you think transformers can be parallelized during training and testing. By testing, I mean inference or deployment. Let's take a particular task in mind, right? Let's say we have translation and we're trying to say, I ate an apple into German. Pardon me, I don't know German, but it probably translated into ich habe und apfel. But let's say I'm right, all right? And when it's trying to decode, it will, can it, can it give you the whole output sequence at once? I see a bunch of nodding nose, wait, a bunch of shaking nose. But, um, so it can't, right? It logically can't. We can't just produce a whole output because our output T plus one depends on what we gave at T, right? So the model can't possibly know what it did at all times at a single time, right? However, you can parallelize the training and only the training. And you can do this by giving it the whole set of outputs. Right, which is, since we talked about tricks of the trade last lecture, we talked about teacher forcing. This here is talking about 100% teacher forcing rate. Right, you give it the whole output all the time. But we need to ensure that the model doesn't cheat. What are we trying to get at here? What does this cheating mean? What might be a problem that will arise if we don't fix this cheating? Yeah. So since we talked about in deployment, the model will never know the future. It shouldn't know the future in the training either because, well, then it's not really learning anything, is it? Right. One way to fix this is we can just reuse the attention weights we had. The attention quite literally means that you find out how much information comes from all of the inputs that I have, and you can just set the attention to zero for anything that you want arbitrarily. And in this case, we set everything at times t prime, which is greater than your current time step t, to zero. What this means in program is before moving into the softmax, you can set it to a negative infinity so that e to the power negative infinity goes to zero, right? 
And this ensures what's known as the autoregressive property. Uh, this term, I mean, if you're confused, autoregressive just means there is a certain order implied, and you go left to right or right to left. So this ensures it during training. Cool. Next is this middle thing, which tends to, which seems to be making the decoder side a little bit taller than the encoder side. And if you notice, the, the sort of coils which come in, there are two coming in from the encoder and one coming in from the decoder, right? This happens because, since we, as you talked about, the query is what's trying to find out where do I pay the attention. So the query comes from the decoder. At time step t, the decoder, <clears throat> excuse me, the, de the decoder is trying to figure out what part of the encoded output do I pay attention to, right? So the query comes from the decoder and the keys and values come from the encoder. And so there's this sort of cross happening between the encoder and the decoder, which is why it's called cross attention, right? Again, the decoder pays attention to the encoder output. Cool, next are these feed forward layers. Nothing magical happening here. These are just your regular feed forward layers and the only reason they're there is to allow for some more computation, capturing some more information. And in fact, they're the same MLP that we talked about last lecture, right? What's left is these residual connections and these add and norm sort of things. We'll dive into this in the next slide, but for now, all you need to remember is add and norm can be calculated in a single line as output of the layer equals layer norm of its input plus the processed input with the sublayer. And the sublayer can be anything. The sublayer can be your attention, the sublayer can be feed forward networks, so sublayer can be, if you want to have an RNN there, it can have an RNN there, it doesn't really care, but this is how it will calculate it. So let's get into the residual connection. Okay. Before that, we have one question, uh, which is, going back to the previous slide, we are giving input as the embeddings, and how will we get uh, queuing and queuing and everything? Well, we get that by projecting them using WQ, WK, and WV. That slide is really far back. I can go back, but given that I added so many transitions, it, it'll take like five minutes for me to get there. But um, there was this point where we had an input and we had three arrows coming out of the input and we had three sort of weights and we projected them into query key and value, right? The idea for projection is also to allow for some amount of differential, but not differential, some amount of variability in your computation because the weight matrices, depending on your initialization, could be random, could be non-random, and you can possibly capture different kinds of information from the three uh, projections. Anything else? One more is why do we need the additional MLP and add layer norm? Well, we'll get to the add layer norm in a second, but we only need the additional MLP. I mean, well, we don't need it, need it. They tried it and it worked better. Right, essentially, it's there for higher level computations, it's there for capturing some more information. It's there for the same reason why you need MLPs at all, right? To capture nonlinearities, to capture information in data, to capture patterns. It's the same reason, it's just that we plug it into an encoder or a decoder, well, module. Does that make sense? Yeah, awesome. Cool, so coming to the second question, which is about the add and norm. The add talks about the residual layer, norm talks about layer norm, which is here, and the X plus sublayer sort of signifies the, resi the residual property, but we'll get into the details of it right now. So what I've done is we've replaced O's with Z's to sort of signify we're not done with the computation yet. And what we do is we take all, each of these Z's, we project them into the output dimension using one more small little linear layer, and we add to that what we had in the beginning, which is H1, right? And now we get our output. What this means, and this is, I think, really important to understand, and this is kind of beautiful, is transformers are inherently residual machines. And I take this quote directly from Professor Maranzi that they are residual machines. And what this means is they're trying to figure out not just what becomes of my meaning, but how do I shift my meaning? And it's also there to sort of make sure that we don't forget what we learned before. I mean, these, represent, these representations weren't useless, right? They had some meaning. There's a reason why they were there. So let's not forget what we had before. And let's just add to it. So what this means is, say, in our original example, which is, I like this movie versus I don't like this movie. The word like maybe originally is pretty positive, right? 
So its representation in I like this movie won't change too much from what the rep representation was without the context at all. But the moment we put do not there, the moment it becomes I do not like this movie, the representation for like will pay a lot of attention to the word not, right? And if, say, this axis is the sentiment axis and this is positive and this is negative, like sort of lies here for, for now. The moment it sees not, it has the incentive to move its own representation to the negative end. And now the sentence sort of does not have a positive sentiment anymore. It's talking about how someone does not like the movie, right? And this is what I mean by shift. So we have our original representation of like, and say in a multi-dimension case, it's, it's a vector that's sort of facing that way. And this direction is what the sentiment is, and we just sort of knock it on the negative side a little bit. But we don't forget everything that we had. So of course, we do the same thing for every single output. And then we have our final outputs using the residual sort of, the, using the residual uh, paradigm. Right? I've not shown the normalization here because you can sort of work that out yourself. But this is the point of the residual layers. What's W0 in this case? Oh, it's, it's WO. Okay. Uh, o stands for output. So that's not, that's not the key. No, no, it's just one more final linear layer on top of them. Is that the MLP? No, the MLP comes on top of that. So um, the MLP is there. So the add and norm is what has, so the multi-head attention before it goes out has that one final linear layer. The reason why I didn't talk about it is because, is because we hadn't talked about the residual yet. But you see that linear above the concat? That's precisely what it is. That linear layer is just the output projection of your outputs. Okay. Cool. Excuse me, can you hear me? Yep. Can you explain shift again? The same point about here? Like the word shift. Oh, the you word shift. It. Yeah, how, how would you interpret it? Thank you. Oh, I would interpret that as I have my current representation, which in some vector space points there maybe. And what I've learned from my context says I should not be facing there. Maybe I should be facing to my left a little bit. So I have this vector as my representation and I just move myself slightly to the left. So I add a computed vector on top of it. It's nothing but vector addition happening, which is what comes up as a shift here. Does that make sense? It's a very slight nuanced difference. It's not too different from coming up with a whole new representation anyway. It, I mean, realistically it is, but inherently it's sort of preserving what it had before and adding on top of it, instead of just making itself a weighted sum. Does that make sense? Oh, why do we have this weighted sum? Like what's the intuition behind adding this here? Well, the weighted sum is there because we want to use all the information, but in a varying amount of degree. The residual here is there to, once again, make sure we don't forget what we had before. It's to preserve whatever computation we did before we got to the multi-head attention layer and just add on top of it. Okay, thank you. Yeah? Yeah. Um, are those weights W or shared again? Yeah. These WO are the same for every single block of attention here. So each of these N blocks will have the same uh, output linear layer because each of these um, multi-head attention blocks have one common linear layer. Yeah? Cool. Actually, coming back to the question which was asked on Zoom, one way to think about it is it's possible that the attention that the node pays to itself ends up being really close to zero, right? That case is not impossible, it is possible. And in that case, your, the meaning of the word that you're trying to find will become a sum of everything else but itself. And that sort of doesn't really make semantic sense. So we want to preserve what we had before, yeah? Cool. So what's left is what's called as positional encoding, right? Nowhere so far have we seen any sort of sense of order being present, any sense of sequentiality present. And since we're doing sequence to sequence task, the order should be important. 
right? I mean, we can't just arbitrarily produce outputs. They need to be in some order, which makes sense. Say, if we're doing uh, language translation, it should make sense in the language that you're translating from and in the language that you're translating to. So transformers don't have any inherent idea of uh, sequentiality because, well, if they did, they would be sequential and they wouldn't be parallelizable. Right? So what we have to do is we have to sort of enforce this notion of order ex very explicitly to the transformer. So we inject this information about order into the transformer. And this is where the position encodings come in. Now, in the last lecture, Professor talked about this pretty complicated way of coming up with the encodings, and this is what the attention is all you need paper describes as well. So they have some sinusoidal uh, properties and you can find out where things are. But for the purposes of today, we will simplify this a little bit, right? Let's say our position encodings are nothing but one hot vectors. And the one position in the vector signifies where this token is in the sequence, right? So P1 will have a one in the first position and zeros everywhere else. Similarly, P5 will have one last position and zeros everywhere else, right? And what we do is we take these encodings, we slap them on top of or besides our input representations, and we have an augmented sort of input representations, which are H1 concatenated with P1. And we, all we have to do now is change the input shape that the multi-head attention expects, and everything works out, right? I mean, much like a lot of deep learning, in my opinion, this also works on hope. It is a function of hope that we hope it understands that this is where the position is. But according to even things like information theory, as long as the information is there, it should be use usable, right? So yeah, that's all we have. And we have position encodings added on top of H1. In the original architecture, what they do is they add them Right? So they have an element-wise addition of the input representations with the position encoding. Here, all we're doing is concatenating them. I mean, what you do with it doesn't really matter as long as you do it. Right? And of course, some position encoding techniques are better than others. I'll just get to you in a second. And this is probably the most naive way of doing it. But this will also probably work. Yeah, you had a question? The only thing do a skip connection way of adding some Mm -hmm. So that's a very good point, actually. And if you notice, the position encodings come before the transformer layers ever have a chance to work on the input. So the gradients never flow all the way here because this is not where your weight matrices lie. And your position encoding is a deterministic process. Even in the case of the transformer, which is here, it only depends on where you are in your sequence, right? It only depends on T. You've already fixed what omega is, which is this fancy W here, right? So the gradients have no business in the position encoding. So the model doesn't need to know where this came from. For the model, everything under the rounded boxes, which are the N blocks, is black is it can't see it. All it knows is I'm getting some inputs. It doesn't care about where I'm getting them from, right? And that's why it doesn't matter how you do it. I mean, of course, it matters in the sense that some will give you better performance than the other because they might capture more information. But um, yeah, the model doesn't particularly care about where they're coming from. Similar to what you were saying about the noise is that I've always wondered, like, let's say you have an embedding that's 100 long, mm -hmm. and your positional encoding is also obviously 100 mm -hmm. And so you're shifting all these vectors. How, how can you tell between a word of this kind of position encoding and this versus like, you know, a word of this and positional encoding and this that, that look the same when they don't have any other? Oh. It seems like it would obscure things. Well, you're right. You can't. There is no real way of telling them apart once you have done the computation because the model doesn't try to backtrack on its computations. But as you said, because they're like 100 dimensional, 300 dimensional, A, the chances of two vectors pointing in the same direction is very unlikely. And even in your sort of, the way you waved your hands, it sort of assumes that there are two dimensions in which you can do it. And in two dimensions, it makes sense. It can happen quite often, especially if you normalize everything. If everything's between zero and one, and you're adding a bunch of zero, one vectors, and it, it can very likely happen that you have this vector, and you add this position, 
and it goes here, and you had this vector, and you had this position, and it goes here as well, and the model doesn't know what happened here. That is possible, but it wouldn't happen in the dimensionality that we're talking about. Especially if we go and use one hot vectors even for input representations, we would have vectors as long as our vocabulary, right? Which in English, in most models, is at least 50,000, 150,000. And that's too large a dimensionality on the scale of how long sequences are for it to. It's after embedding, though, right? So that, that doesn't matter. Exactly. Yeah, so. The dimensionality of your embedding. Exactly, right. So the dimensionality of our embedding would either be something like 300, 600, depending on what you use, or it'll be one hot vectors of how much you have in your vocabulary. After embedding? Okay. Yeah, you can still use, I mean, assume if input embedding doesn't exist, if all input embedding does is make a dictionary call to where I am in my dictionary, and it'll still give you a one hot encoded input embedding of sorts. It's not a very smart encoding. It's, it's linearly independent of everything else, which doesn't make, really make sense, but it is an encoding, embedding. So to give time to UA as well, um, you have one last poll. And since this has about seven options, and to allow you to not get confused between the wordings, um, I'll give you about a minute to go through this. Okay, before we move on, any takers for the answers? Well, okay, I think that's time. So the answers are A, C, and F, nothing else here. Uh, we can go over them. We talked about how it tries to calculate the shift in meaning. Uh, well, they can clearly not always be run in parallel because once we've deployed them, the, the decoder at least has to be sequential. Uh, the transformer decoders can only be parallelized during training. Uh, position encodings can help parallelize the transformer encoder. Not really. They're only there to enforce the sense of order. Query keys and values can be obtained by splitting input into three equal lengths. That's false. We do that when we do multi-head attention. And they actually get computed by using projections, linear projections. Uh, multi-head attention helps transformers find different kinds of relations between tokens. A caveat is it won't always find different kinds of information. There might be redundant, there might be no information at all. It's, a, again, a function of hope, right? And uh, during decoding, decoder output functions as queries and keys while values come from encoder. This is also false because decoder gives you the queries and the keys and values come from the encoder, right? So in summary, we have Q, K, and V. The roles that they play is Q pays the attention, values are paid attention to, Keys allow you to compute how much attention the query needs to pay on each of the values, right? There's self-attention versus cross-attention. Self is when all three come from the same place. Cross is when they don't. Transformers are residual machines. Position encodings allow transformers to understand some sense of order. Transformers' biggest advantage is lies in their parallelizability, right? And what I mean by, yeah. So the model doesn't seem deep because these guys are smart about making the diagram. That's, that's, that's really it. That's, that's all it is because there are n blocks, right? And each of these blocks have a lot of computation going on. The multi-head attention, each of the attention heads have three weight matrices coming in and they have one weight matrix going out and each of them have one feed forward layer which, which is usually two layer deep, right? And there are n of these, so there are two n feed forwards on the encoder side and there are two n feed forwards on the decoder side and you have all of these other computations happening in multi-head attention, 
multi-head cross attention, multi-head mask attention. So don't be mistaken, it is a deep network. And so residual connections also help in letting the gradients flow backwards easily, as you've learned in ResNet. Yeah, you can think about it like that. Right, uh, so I was at the point of omnidirectionality. Well, uh, the Bird paper calls it bidirectional. I disagree. I don't think it's bidirectional. I don't think the transformer cares how many directions there are. It'll just make use of everything that's available to it. So omnidirectional makes more sense because the two is just a factor of, or an art artifact of what we're working with. I mean, if we had four directions to deal with, it will deal with four directions. It doesn't really care. Okay. One thing to remember, though, is, and this is an empirical uh, out, uh, outcome, that on smaller sequence lengths, RNN-based models like LSTMs and GRUs tend to perform better, a little more efficiently, because they don't have all of these pa uh, parameters, all of this computation. Yes, be it it's happening in parallel, but there is still a lot of computation being hap uh, happening, right? So. When you have smaller sequence lengths, you don't have to necessarily build a transformer for it. Something like LSTMs or GRUs will work just fine, right? And I had some, a couple of extra slides. You do I have two minutes extra? Uh, yeah, there is two slides. Awesome, cool. Could you define small and large? Well, I, if I'm not wrong, the study suggested that anything beyond a length of 86, 87, 90, ballpark, let's say 100, Transformers seem to perform better. Uh, and below that, LSTMs and GRUs tend to perform better. Around that 180, 60 sort of range, it's kind of fuzzy. It depends on what domain you're in, things like that. But uh, as, a, as a default, if you have sequences which are like 10, 12, 13 long, you don't need a transformer for it. Right? You can use a transformer, tr transformer for it, but it's like using an ax to cut a sandwich. I mean, you don't really need it. A knife can do the job. So a couple of extra slides here is that the energy functions of the attention scores we talked about can come in any form that you can think of, right? What we use is the scale dot product. The S here talks about the scaling factor. If S was one, it would have been just dot product, right? There's something known as bilinear in which you have this weight matrix between the Q and the K. And there's also something known as, well, the MLP in which you pass it through M and MLP and you get output representations. Um, well, representations of, or scores of attention. Right? You can use any of them. The paper just happened to use scale dot product attention. And as I mentioned, attention wasn't introduced in a transformer paper. Attention was introduced in a 2015 paper by Barnado, right? And one last thing I wanted to mention is how all of this works in batching. This tends to be confusing when you go down and try start to code it. In the attention function, you have query keys and values. In batch form, there would be B cross T cross D Q or D K or D V, which sometimes, most of the times, end up being the same. When you calculate the attention function or the attention score uh, using the dot product scale attention, you're, you'll have an energy matrix of the shape B comma T comma T. And you can sort of figure this out. It'll happen when you do the matrix multiplication. And your output vector, when you do the softmax of E, which is the attention, transpose V, will end up in the shape of B, T, D, V. So this is just to sort of reinforce the fact that it will work in parallel. Right, and with that, we'll move on to GNNs, and we can take a question. Yeah, just one question. So uh, the fact that you're using the parallelize is because like, you're considering all the inputs together. Yeah, so yeah. To me, this appears like it's almost like an energy, but just positional yeah, you can say that. In a way, so like transform all, all the rings, like they are considering all of them together, just position them in the length of the network. Yeah, yeah. So you can think of it, yes, like an MLP, but it's not really. The core of it is the attention module. The core of it is the fact that it's able to figure out how important each of my inputs are to me, and me being one particular token. What's parallelized is not the fact that it's using everything. Even the LSTM-based attention was using everything in the encoder at each time step of the decoder. What's being parallelized is I can calculate what's important for me and all of the other people in my token sequence and all of the other people in my batch all at the same time. 
the parallelization is not the computation of the attention, but it's the fact that I can compute attention for everything all at once. That's the parallelizability, which is why it's not essentially just an MLP being done in parallel, which is why the self-attention module is at the core of it. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah I think that's time. That's time for UA to take over. Okay, hi everybody, my name is Yue. So now let's move on to the graph neural network parts. Uh, I don't think I have enough time today, so if I cannot finish, I will leave the rest, uh, rest of my parts to the recitation, so uh, don't worry about that. Uh, so for the graph neural network parts, I would like to introduce two topics. So the first one is a very important property, which, uh, which is called the invariance. Uh, and for the graph neural nets, uh, the permutation invariance is what we are uh, more interested in. Uh, and the second part, I'm going to go through the structure of the graph neural networks and also the mathematical forms of the forward equation. And if I have more times, uh, we, can go, uh, we can also go through the backward. So before we start to talk about the graph neural networks, Let's revisit the data structure we have met uh, during the previous study. So during the homework one and homework two, we have uh, been very familiar with the sequence data and the image data. So if we extract the structure from this, so the sequence data is just a line of data and the grid data is a two dimensional version of the sequence. And now we have already got some models to dealing with this data, or more specifically, we use those models to extract features from these two kind of data. So for the sequence data, we have the RN and uh, also MLP will work for this kind of model. Uh, and the CN is designed for the image data. So now our, uh, the question is, uh, uh, both these two kinds of data are kind of uh, uh, have their own orders. What if I met with some of the data that is uh, more disordered and unstructured, or to say uh, graph-like data? So here I give three of the examples of this kind of data uh, to show that this kind of data, data are very uh, common in our daily life. So the first example is uh, molecules in the chemistry and biology. And the second is the social network. Uh, the third is a 3D mesh that is very commonly used in mechanical engineering. Uh, it is used for finite element uh, method computation. So now is, uh, seems like this kind of data is more disordered than the previous two. One. Can we use the uh, model we have to uh, well handle this kind of data, or is there any limitation that will happen due to the uh, the structure change of the data? That is uh, what our uh, that is our motivation to discuss the topic today. So we want to have a deep learning model to adapt to this kind of unstructured data. Uh, now let's start with a very uh, simple example. So assume I am a chemist and I'm interested in learning some property of the molecules. Uh, here, the example I give is called the ionic molecule. So ionic molecule is a uh, good candidate to absorb uh, carbon dioxide and also good for solving the greenhouse gas problems and global warming. Uh, but to be simple, what I'm caring here about is uh, if I have a molecules and I want to study the, a specific property of this molecule, like 
uh, the solubility of the carbon dioxide in this kind of molecules. And what I have now is I got a data set. So the data sets are composed of the data and the labels. Data I have is the molecule structure and the label is the carbon dioxide solubilities. And uh, I can do the experiment to test out this property, but I want to use a more faster way. I want to utilize the uh, power of the deep learning. So uh, how can we deal with this kind of cases? Uh, it is obviously that this is highly related to graph neural networks, but before that, uh, I want to ask a question. Uh, without knowing the graph neural network, can we deal with this kind of problems with the knowledge we have learned? Um, or to say with the multilayer perceptron, the convolution neural networks, or the recurrent neural network. Uh, do you think the answer is yes or no? Okay, I see, some, uh, I see that somebody uh, showed me the yes signs. Uh, yes, uh, so the answer is yes, but there might be some limitation raised uh, during this process. And those limitations is highly related to a important properties, which is called the invariance. Uh, so let's, uh, let's introduce what is the invariance. So assume I have a mapping that map from a uh, variable x to y. Uh, if there exists a mapping function g, which is not the same as f, such that f of g of x equal to fx equal to y, then I say function f is invariant to function g. Or uh, in other ways, uh, for example, if I have a neural networks, because neural network is a function approximator, we can treat the neural networks as f. And we have the data, uh, which is x here, and label is y. So if I apply a operation g on the input data before I fit it into the neural network, and those operations won't change the output result, then I say, I can say that neural network is invariant to these kind of uh, operations. Right. Uh, and here is some example to help you further understand these uh, concepts. So now let's start from the most basic uh, cases. So now imagine I have a neural networks and uh, my function f is the neural networks and the Operation G here is I permute the input data. I permute the orders. Uh, so in this case, uh, can anyone tell me, will I get the same output result from this uh, three neural net? There are only one sequence data with different order. Uh, so the result is no, because uh, the every perceptron has their own orders within the networks. If you permute the input data, uh, it will not output the uh, same result. And we say that multilayer perception is not permutation invariance. Okay, and there's three uh, more concepts. Now I change my data from sequence to the images, and but my function f is still MLP. And the, uh, and the operation G I made here is I shift the flowers from one side to the other side. I think you have already met this uh, before in the CNN. So uh, will this output the same result or to say F is invariant to G? No. Right, yeah, this is no, because MRP is not shift invariance or to say translation invariance. Now I made one more modification. If I change it into CNN, so obviously this time it will output the same feature because CNN is a shift or to say translation invariance model, right? Okay, now I do, uh, this is the final examples. Now I change the shift to the rotation. Okay, I see some, uh, some of you say no here. Yeah, because CN is not a rotation invariant uh, model. So I think after these four examples, we shall have a good idea of what is the invariance. Now let's return back to our, pro uh, to our problems. Uh, I will try to solve these problems without GNN, but with the multilayer perceptron or the convolutional neural net. But uh, I, I recommend you to keep this question in mind. So what is the desired properties that we need for the model to solve the, this kind of problems that 
fit in uh, that uh, when handling the graph like the data. So the first uh, solution I propose is I can use the multi-layer perceptron to deal with these questions. So if I want to use the MLP, I have to make the data into the sequence form. But obviously, my data is in a uh, is a molecule and it's non-sequence. So one possible solution is I can use the empirical formula. So uh, you have already, uh, you guys must have already met this in your high school studies. So I can use the empirical formula to transfer the molecules into a sequence, and then I can use a very simple one-hot embedding to make the string into a matrix and fit it into the multi-layer perceptron. And then output the result. So do you agree with me? Uh, this, so this is a reasonable method to extract the feature from the molecule, right? And now the problem is, if I swap two of the elements within these molecules, like the, floor, uh, the fluorine and the nitrogens, um, the formula will still obey the chemical rule. But um, it is obvious that MLP will output me a different result. Or to say, uh, if I change the order of these two elements, MLP will not recognize this molecule anymore. So that's the problem when we want to use the MLP to solve this uh, molecule data. Uh, and the reason is MLP is not permutation equal, uh, invariant. And here comes the second uh, solutions. Now I try to use the convolutional neural net to solve these problems. Uh, because convolutional neural nets fit in the, fit, uh, is fit with the images. Uh, for example, I can take some photos for the molecules and I can easily do that with some um, software that can draw a pictures for the molecules. Uh, and after that, I can use those pixel-like data, which contain the images for this molecule in the 3D space. And I fit it into the convolutional neural net. But uh, if I rotated these images, it is still the same molecules, but this time CNN won't recognize this molecule anymore, right? Because CNN is not rotational invariant, okay? So after these uh, two possible solutions, uh, I think we have seen the limitation of the multi-layer perceptron and the CNN when handling with the uh, molecule data. Mm, ah, I'll skip this part. So that brings us to a new kind of data representation and a model structures uh, where we want to use the power of the graph to solve this kind of problems. Uh, so to start with, uh, let's recall some basic, uh, in basic knowledge for graph. So graph is composed of two very important components. The first is the nodes, and we also call that vertices. And the second is the edges. So if we want to define a graph, we can use a set of nodes and a set of edges uh, to define a graph structures. Uh, here is a very... Uh, very simple example, there is an undirected graph. So undirected means I do not care about direction of the edges within the graph. And uh, I can use a set of nodes, which is V here, and also a set of tuple. Each tuple uh, stands for a edges, and uh, there is two nodes, uh, which is the start nodes and end node of that edges. So this is uh, uh, how we write a graph in a mathematical forms. And uh, we can also develop a matrix form representation uh, for the graph. I think this part uh, should be also very familiar to you. Uh, so usually uh, we use an node information matrix, which has the shape of n cross f. So the n here is the number of the node, and f here is number of the features. Uh, and this node information matrix can carry the node information. On the other hand, uh, we also need some uh, matrix to represent the connectivity or the edge information, which is the adjacency matrix here. So as you can see, the blue elements here is represent to, uh, is equal to one. So I want to make this more intuitive, so I change into this kind of pixel-like uh, image. Uh, and all of this uh, one element is stands for the edges within this graph. So that is the adjacency matrix. Uh, 
uh, and pay attention to the shape. The shape is n cross n because you have to include the nodes uh, in each uh, in a row in both row and columns. So uh, after we introduce the graph, uh, I have to uh, discuss one important property of the graph that is different from the sequence data or the grid data. That is, uh, graph do not have a canonical order of the nodes. So what do I mean by saying the canonical, do not have a canonical of the nodes? Uh, let's consider two other plans. Uh, so it is shown on the slide. So these two other plans, the uh, difference between them is uh, I named each, uh, I named the same node with different name, but uh, the relative position of a node within this graph is still remain the same. Or to say I permute the name of each node, right? Uh, so what happens is I can definitely extract a node matrix and a adjacent matrix from this two representation of graph, right? And now I get this uh, two combination of matrix. So now if, now let's say I do not know this two graph, the original version of the graph. I, uh, I trying to re, uh, reconstruct this two graph uh, with the node matrix and adjacency <coughs> matrix, I can then if I can re, uh, if I can reconstruct a same graph, uh, I say that these two order plans do not have canonical order of nodes, and the answer is yes. I can definitely reconstruct the same graph with these two matrix because the relative positions of nodes uh, remain unchanged. So this is a very nice properties. Uh, and if we take one step further uh, and define it mathematically, I say, now I have a graph, it's defined by V and E's. And there is a mapping can map a, the graph to a vectors. Then uh, what we want is a function F of V1 and E1 equal to function uh, F of V2 and E2. So this is our desired property. Because graphs do not have the canonical order of nodes, uh, and so, uh, and now if we consider a neural network that can mapping the graph from the, from the original matrix to a uh, new vectors, we want the mapping result to be the same. So for a graph with M nodes, there's an M factorials of the order plans, not just there are two, these two order plans. So if I, uh, uh, so, if I say for any of the ij pair within the order plans, uh, uh, function f of vi, ei, and equal to function f of vj, ej, then I can formally define that function f is permutation invariant for the graph representation of v and e, right? So uh, this permutation invariance is, a, is what we are interested in and what we uh, and the desired property for the graph neural network. So, okay, so actually GNN consists of a series of permutation invariant layers. Mm, so uh, actually, uh, after I uh, introduce the graph representations, uh, now is the, not uh, what we need to do is we need to design the neural network uh, structures. Uh, still, can uh, I have a guess? So. If, uh, I can use the graph representation, but uh, can we still reach the permutation invariance by combining this uh, graph representation with MLP? Uh, since we have already know that graph do not have canonical order of nodes, right? Let's say, uh, let's see if this kind of property can help us a little bit. Uh, uh, what we do is we concatenate the adjacency matrix with the node feature matrix. And now we have a new matrix, we can fit it into the neural network. Uh, if, we want to, if we want to test the permutation invariance, then we can like swap two column or rows within this matrix. So uh, will this uh, swap operations, pr uh, I mean, uh, will the data before or after the swap produce me the same results? Uh, really? Uh, actually, the answer is no, because we are still using a 
so after we concatenate these two gra uh, these two metrics together and fit it into MLP, these two metrics are still have a uh, have the orders. Uh, it is still similar to sequence data. The key idea here is even if we use the graph representation, we did not make any changes in the neural networks uh, operations. So it is still permutation. It is still not permutation invariant. And that's why we are going to introduce uh, the design for the graph neural networks. Okay, the story so far is a uh, graph can be represented by the uh, feature, node feature matrix and the adjacency matrix. Uh, and graph representation do not have a canonical order of nodes. And permutation invariance is uh, what we want to design a graph neural network. Uh, so from the example uh, in the previous slide, we have seen that MLP cannot uh, reach the permutation invariant even fit in with the graph data. Uh, now I want to borrow some ideas from the CNN uh, to redesign the neural network structures. So if you recall in the convolutional neural net, we use one kernel and we convolve the certain regions and then we output a new pixel values as the value of the new layers. Uh, so this operations uh, is like the picture I show here. So here is a three by three uh, kernel and I use this kernel to convolve images. If I uh, draw this picture in a node and edges forms, we can see the element wise products during the convolution is like we aggregate, uh, let's see, uh, let's say the nodes here is uh, what we're interested in. So the convolution here is like we aggregate the neighbor uh, features. We use the pointwise product to aggregate the neighbor features into the center node. And then we merge a new values uh, as, our, as the pixel in the new layers. So if we, uh, so more specifically, we can say that uh, we are generating the node embeddings from its local neighbor environments. So this is the key idea to design a graph neural network. So in the graph, we can apply the similar, uh, the similar kind of ideas uh, as you can see in the final uh, slides. Even if the graph do not have the uh, grid-like structures, it still has the neighbor because there's edges and there's a nodes. So we can, um, follow the similar ideas and aggregate the neighbor uh, features into the sing into a certain node and generate the node embeddings. So that is the key ideas for designing a graph convolution. Okay, and that's also the reason why we call the, uh, okay, question. Could you just say the graph convolution? Uh, yeah, so the graph convolution uh, is, so because I start to introduce the idea from the scene, which is the convolution neural network. So during the convolutions, you use a uh, kernel uh, to do the po point-wise uh, product and add an app and merge a new value, right? And during the graph convolution, we can follow in the similar ideas. This time, uh, you can understand it as we use a certain size of kernel, but this kernel is different from the pixel. Uh, it is like we have, and I will uh, go into detail about this in the, uh, in the coming slide. Uh, so you are still doing the point, uh, kind of point-wise uh, products and you aggregate the feature together into one new values and you update the pixels. Uh, is, that, uh, is that clear? Okay, uh, let's go into details about this. Uh, so now let's, uh, let's see what is the graph convolution. Uh, imagine now I, have, I still have this graph and uh, I want to do the graph convolutions. And now what I'm interested in is this target node B. Uh, so now I only consider one single step of the graph convolution. Based on the ideas uh, we know, uh, we want to aggregate the, node, uh, the neighborhood's information to this node B, right? So we want, to, uh, we want to find a way to combine the neighborhood information and merge it into a new values and assign it to the node B. So that is basically what we want to do, right? So, uh, so uh, we have to uh, have the, three inf the information of this three node and put it into this gray box and then merge the new values. And also 
After, so after one step of the graph convolutions, this node B will have an idea of uh, how does it belong within this graph by knowing its, the information from its uh, first nearest neighbor. Uh, now it is not only containing the information itself, but also the first nearest neighbor's information. Uh, and there's also one thing to remember is uh, during the former, uh, during the previous slides, I aggregate the A, C, and D's information, but uh, after I merge the new information and assign it to B, uh, B has lost itself's information from the previous time step because I didn't include that. So it's important to adding a self loop here to make sure the information of B is, uh, is uh, maintained during this convolution process. So finally, uh, the form becomes like this. So at the time step T minus one, I, uh, I aggregated four nodes of features which is the neighbor as well as B itself. And we combine the information, we merge it into new value. So that value will be the information of node B at the time step T, right? Uh, so if I perform two time st steps of the graph convolution, uh, now following the similar uh, manners, we will have, uh, so the node B will not containing the information from its first nearest neighbor as well as the second nearest neighbor, right? Because in the, so if we, if we go into details, at the time step T minus one, uh, every node do not know each other's. Uh, and if we moving on one time steps, every node will know the first uh, nearest neighbors. And at this time steps, node, uh, node D will have an idea, have the information of the E and F. So in the next time step, when we aggregate the node D's features into the B, D will carry the information from both E, F, as well as the D itself to the node B, right? So, at, so after two time steps, the node B will carry the information from, it, uh, from the range of its second nearest neighbor. So that is uh, a very intuitive um, show on the graph convolution. And since, uh, since this process is kind of like you are passing the information from the neighbor to the nodes, we also call this process message passing. So that is a very uh, common concept in the graph neural networks. Okay, so now we know how are we doing the message passing and doing the, and convolve the information within the graph. There's one problem left. What's happened within this gray box, right? We have to combine the information and merge it, but how are we going to do that? So usually there is two steps you need to do. The first step is singly you want to combine the information. So when you combine the information, you have to make the shape the same. So the, uh, the operation we used to use is like you can use the sum, the products, the mean, the max, or the minimum. So those are like the pooling operation. We just want to combine the information. So in the traditional um, graph convolution neural networks, I mean the uh, first paper of GCN, they use a mean here. So during the following, step, uh, following slide, when I deriving the uh, mass equation for the graph convolution, I will use the mean as the combining functions. Uh, and after that, because this is a neural networks, which means uh, we have to have the learnable parameters and we need to optimize the whole neural networks based on the loss. So I also need to apply a neural network after I combine this information and merge it as a new values to assign to the node B. Uh, so this two step is, two step is necessary to, uh, for the uh, feature aggregation. So following this kind of manners, if we uh, if we do the graph convolution for every node within the graph uh, at the same time step, then all of this add up to a single layer of the graph neural network. So that's generally what's happened within a single layer of GNN. Okay, so now we have uh, introduced a, the process and uh, how the features are aggregated. Sorry, let me see if I have time. Okay, one minute. Uh, seems like I don't have enough times. Uh, so I prepared both the scalar form as well as the matrix form of the uh, single layer of graph convolution. Uh, 
But uh, there is still one recitation on GN, which is in the early December, I think. So I will uh, elaborate this part very carefully into uh, detail by details, derive the whole process of the forward equation as well as the backward during that recitation. So yeah, please feel free to join the uh, recitation and I'll see you in the early December. Thank you. Thank you.